welcome uh, online and in person to the uh, last and largest Russia and Eurasia program event of the year out of about 60. Uh, largest with, I think, about 220 people registered online and what, 20, 30 in, in the hall here today. And I think that is because of the importance of the topic, clearly, the UK's problem with kleptocracy and the brilliance uh, of this new Chatham House report authored by uh, four people on stage, plus a couple of others. Um, and I can't say how, well, the reason I am introducing here is because John Heathershaw, who will chair the first session, can't say it's brilliant. I absolutely can. I'm very proud to be publishing it. Um, but it is extensively and intensively researched. Um, and it is uh, the most important problem. I think it's at least as important a problem as the fact there are 90,000 Russian troops uh, east of uh, the Ukrainian border right now. Uh, and that is really all I just want to say right now. I'm just, uh, I'll be chair this, come back and chair the second session. But first of all, congratulations to all of the authors and to John in particular. This is a collaboration between Chatham House and the Global Integrity Anti-Corruption Evidence Project, um, which is run by several universities, not least the University of Exeter. And again, we're very, very happy to be publishing it right here, right now. Over to you. Thank you, James. And welcome to everyone from, from myself and our team. I should also say thank you to Chatham House and specifically to the Russia and Eurasia program, uh, James, Lubitscher, and all of them for their support uh, through this process. Um, it is, as James said, the culmination of actually three years of a global integrity anti-corruption evidence project on the international architecture of corruption and anti-corruption. For many of us, that is research going back 10, 15, 20 years, in fact. For the project, we brought together three twins, oh, sorry, three twins, three, three themes um, with regard to the whole area of corruption and anti-corruption. They are banking, real estate, and the area of reputation laundering. And you'll see them in the report um, and the research we're drawing on there. So what we're doing is thinking about transnational kleptocracy, and that's something of a mouthful, but we're really talking about three sets of actors here. In our context, we are thinking about kleptocrats, elites from kleptocratic states, but also their associates and their exiles. In this specific regional context, that's post-Soviet elites who govern systems in which public institutions are used to enable a network of ruling elites to steal public funds for their own private gain. The second set of actors we're thinking about, and these are especially important in our report, are the enablers. They are those, largely in this context, based in the UK, who offer a variety of servicing needs and behaviors to, to the elites aforementioned. Some of these are licit, illicit, perfectly illicit, perfectly legal, probably the majority. Some are illicit. Uh, some of these enablers are willingly complicit in the money laundering or corruption of which they are a part. Others, in many cases, it's reflecting a negligence or a willingness to look the other way, or are simply following the logic of the market in their chosen area of profession. A final set of actors are the regulators, and obviously they're especially important in dealing with this problem. They are those at the moment who, who are leaving loopholes, who are allowing financial secrecy, and are failing to properly enforce the laws that we already have. This leads me to this morning's event where our foreign secretary came to give our major, her first major speech uh, advocating a British trade policy, which as I understand it is unashamedly commercial. Presumably that will mainly be focused on the trade in services because that's where the UK's strength lies. According to uh, Liz Truss, we have an anti-money laundering system which is the strongest in the world. So, so much for the rhetoric. We're going to dwell on the reality now. We're looking at a specific set of clients for services from the UK, and we're going to focus on that. Before I hand over to my three colleagues and introduce them, I just want to say a couple more words on why this is a problem from a regulatory perspective and from a statecraft perspective, actually. Firstly, it's a problem internationally for the UK. It's bad for developing countries, the countries that we suppose that we are going to support, uh, because enormous amounts of capital flights very often dwarf the amount of aid that the UK can give to some of the poorer post-Soviet states. 
I think it's bad for the UK in relative position to its other states, to, to other states. In 2016, the UK could reasonably claim to be a global leader in this field. Uh, this week, with the US as own launching of an anti-corruption strategy, uh, it's very clear that I think the UK has fallen behind and failed to deliver on some of its bigger promises from 2016 and David Cameron's anti-corruption summit. And even if one wants to take a Machiavellian point of view, there's little evidence that the UK is effective as a gatekeeper, that it is able to leverage uh, its role as the entry point to the global economy and the global financial system. It's able to uh, extract things from elites. So it's bad internationally. But our focus really, and this is the focus of this session, is that it's bad domestically. It's a problem domestically. Firstly, that's because it erodes the UK's capacity to assess risk. And that's what Jason is going to talk about with respect to banking and the AML system. Secondly, it weakens new anti-corruption initiatives and creates an imbalance of power between the regulators and the supposedly regulated. And, and Tom's going to address that with respect to real estate. Uh, and then thirdly and finally, it brings authoritarian agendas and rivalries to the UK. That includes libel to tourism, it includes effects which undermine the integrity of domestic institutions, such as philanthropy in the university sector, which is almost entirely non-transparent. And Tenor will talk about that. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to my three colleagues. We're going to start with Professor Jason Sharman from the University of Cambridge. Great. Thanks very much, John. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And first off, I'd like to thank John for his leadership of the project. Um, for those who might have had a chance to glance at the report, there's a fairly bold and fairly unflattering statement about the ineffectiveness of international standards on the transparency uh, of corporate bank accounts and shell companies. Um, that applies in Britain, but also more generally. Uh, and I think a fair question would be, well, how do you know that this system um, designed to promote financial transparency doesn't work? Um, and the evidence from the report draws on a big project I've done in collaboration with two co-authors, uh, Mike Finley and Dan Nielsen, both at the University of Texas. And basically went on a big shopping expedition to see whether it was possible to buy anonymous or untraceable shell companies and associated bank accounts uh, in contravention of those international transparency standards. Uh, it was big. Um, we made about 40,000 email solicitations to about 5,000 banks. That's every single bank in the world that's connected to the international financial system, um, but also to 7,000 so-called corporate service providers. That is the businesses whose business it is to set up and shell, sell shell companies. In this kind of global mystery shopping expedition, or more properly, a field experiment, we didn't use our own names. Um, we instead invented a cast of fictitious consultants, some deliberately very high risk profile, some deliberately low risk, but we also incorporated 12 real shell companies uh, in different countries uh, and then went shopping on their behalf for corporate bank accounts as well. Um, the basic intuition of the project was that because I'm not a lawyer, I don't really care about what rules or what laws are on the books. Um, they can often be dead letter. I'm interested, and so is Mike and Dan and the rest of this project, in what difference, if any, rules make in practice. And in the spirit of brevity, uh, since I haven't got much time, I think the most succinct um, summary of the recommendations of the report are by John, um, and that's the wisdom of actually enforcing laws on the books. Okay, so we're testing this basic idea of first off, do banks and corporate service providers actually check and establish the identity of the customers for whom they're establishing shell companies or bank accounts? And secondly, seeing whether they do so in line with the dominant regulatory principle of the risk-based approach, a fairly common sense idea that high-risk customers should attract more scrutiny than low-risk customers. And as I say, we deliberately manipulated the profile of both our fictitious consultants and our real shell companies. For some of the fictitious consultants, we took names from the Magnitsky sanctions list, people who should not definitely not be able to access the international financial system, either through shell companies or corporate bank accounts. Um, and then also through uh, the corporate nationality of some of our shell companies. Some were deliberately established in high corruption risk countries. Um, some in low corruption risk countries. If the system of the risk-based approach was working, 
corporate service providers and banks should discriminate and that we should be able to see a difference in the reaction to high risk consultants and high risk shell companies versus their low risk counterparts. Specifically in our email solicitations, we should have got many fewer replies. We should have got many more refusals. We should have got much more scrutiny for the high risk customers um, and a much lower incidence of flouting the rules and selling anonymous financial products in violation of the standards. In fact, what we saw in the UK and more generally um, was an incredible failure to discriminate or a failure to distinguish in that even the most ridiculously high risk profile that we could think of, both for individual consultants and for shell companies, made no difference in the rate of reply, the rate of refusal, the rate of compliance and the rate of non-compliance for both corporate service providers um, and for banks in Britain and more generally. I wanted to finish with a couple of quotes. Um, the first in response to a solicitation for a shell company, the second for a solicitation for a bank account that both gives the flavor of the problem, but also starkly underlines the main point of the report um, that namely how the UK can facilitate kleptocracy. The first reply, this is um, to one of our solicitations, the person helpfully writes back, our international package is ideal for non-residents based outside of the UK. The application can be completed within five minutes and there are no documents required in order to set up a company with us. The package gives you a full London presence through the use of our prestigious London office address services. Very close to here, I might add. You can view the package details and purchase online using the link below. I must say it was pretty cheap as well. So you can get your anonymous UK shell company uh, with a nice London address. The second one for a corporate bank account, the person helpfully writes back, because your clients are Russian citizens and the Russians do not accept Russian clients, we suggest full nominee service set up on the company and open the bank accounts. This is the best solution for you to be confidential. We've set up a shelf company, a preformed shell company with a nominee director and nominee shareholders and can set up each bank account with a nominee signatory. So the bank won't see that you're the real person in control of the account. The bank can only see the nominee. So you will be fully anonymous. You can buy one company and use the account immediately to avoid the OECD tax exchange problem. We always have UK companies and bank accounts for sale. That from apparently the country that has the world's best anti-money laundering system. Thanks very much. And wonderfully to time. So we'll go straight on now to Tom Main, who's my colleague at the University of Exeter and also part of the Russia and Eurasia program here at Chatham House. Uh, thanks, John. Now, one definition of the, of the rule of law is that everyone is accountable to the, to the same laws. Some of you may remember the case of Adaronka Apata, a Nigerian LGBT campaigner who was given asylum in the UK after 13 years of legal battles. Now, when Maxim Bakiev arrived in the UK, he did not have such a history of campaigning work behind him. Instead, he was accompanied by serious allegations that he'd stolen up to $35 million uh, from the Kyrgyz state budget. And yet his asylum claim was processed in much quicker order. Now, even if we concede that, you know, Bakiev has to remain here, we can't send him back to, to the Kyrgyz Republic, surely he, fa he, should, he should face some kind of censure for his alleged crimes. Yet here we are uh, 10 years later, no uh, known investigation into Bakiev, no unexplained wealth order, no account freezing order. And this is in stark contrast to the United States, uh, who attempted to extradite Maxime. They froze $6 million, which they specifically said was as a result of a theft uh, by the Bakir family, including Maxime. And this is a repeated pattern when we look across the board at various uh, kleptocrats. Now, I don't mean to suggest that the United States is some kind of halcyon land of, of anti-corruption measures, but certainly they have a stronger record when it comes to tackling kleptocracy. What about Dmitry Firtash, the uh, Ukrainian oligarch? Uh, he is planning to be extradited from Austria to the United States on charges of alleged bribery. We uh, sold him an old tube station for 50 million pounds. What about Gulnara Karimova, who received $800 million in bribes? Uh, finally, after many years, uh, the serious fraud office has frozen three of uh, Karimova's uh, properties in the UK. This is in contrast to the United States, who have sanctioned uh, Karimova on the, by Global Magnitsky uh, Act. They have indicted her. They've fined the companies over $2 billion totally in total uh, and have uh, uh, frozen uh, the money, importantly. 
Uh, now, the problem is we do have some good laws in the, in the UK. They are just not enforced. An example of this would be the UK Bribery Act that we've had for 10 years, uh, over 10 years. But, but where are the high profile examples? Uh, there was a report last year in the Financial Times that a UK mining company may have paid for a, a luxury trip to Disneyland for the Kazakh Prime Minister. Is this being investigated? Is, is this a possible violation of the Bribery Act? We are, we are, we are blind to, 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 to know what's going, what's, going, uh, what's going on. And I think this is the, 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 the comparison I, I'm drawing between the United States and the UK is I think the reason why we see so much more uh, investment into real estate in the United Kingdom by, by uh, uh, politically exposed persons, if you will, uh, than the United States. In the, our new report, in the annex, we list 99 properties owned by Eurasian politically exposed persons or persons posing high risks, totaling $2.3 billion. Um, 41 of the 99 properties are owned by companies registered in the British Virgin Islands. Where is the registration of overseas entities bill, which has been mothballing on, on the shelf, it seems. This is the bill that uh, intends to put the uh, beneficial owners of companies that own property in the, in the UK uh, on record, still not being uh, enacted. Uh, and I think when we're talking about kleptocracy, what I think the government doesn't seem to understand is that it's not just about money laundering. Um, you know, Rishi Sunak, uh, when confronted with the evidence uh, in the Pandora Papers, referred to our excellent uh, uh, appraisal by the Financial Action Task Force. But the Financial Action Task Force really isn't set up as a, as a kind of anti-kleptocracy agency. It's really looking at money laundering and originally money laundering in relation to, to drug trafficking. And you can, you can prove this by just looking at their um, jurisdictions under increased monitoring. Uh, I've got the list here. So obviously, the, you know, there are some bad guys on there, but there are also Jamaica, Malta, Morocco. Uh, none of uh, the, 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 the famous kleptocracies are on this list. Um, no Azerbaijan. No, Turkmenistan, some of the most corrupt countries in the world, uh, Russia, Kazakhstan, and it's the same with the EU high-risk third countries list, which are supposedly the countries that are posing a, a, a threat to the EU's financial system. Again, no Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, Russia, Azerbaijan, and, and so on. I think we have to be just a little bit more smart when it, it relates to kleptocratic flows. Um, money laundering is a part of it, as I say, but a lot of these flows have been legalized in the, in the country in question. Uh, and that is, I think, what is so galling about recent efforts to, to try and crack down on uh, this kind of, uh, of money. Um, famous example that I've studied a lot over the last few years is the unexplained wealth order issued against properties uh, owned by Dariga Nazabayeva and Nora Aliyev, the daughter and, and grandson of uh, the former president, uh, former now, uh, of Kazakhstan. Um, Nur Ali Aliyev bought a house on the Bishop's Avenue uh, and he got a $65 million loan from it. Where did he get it from? And he got it from a bank in Kazakhstan that he himself was the chairman of and his mother, Dariga, owned at the time. Uh, and there's no evidence to suggest that he's paid that loan back. When it came to the unexplained wealth order hearing, uh, the judge ruled in favor of uh, the, the Nazarbayevs saying that, well, basically, the, the, the loan was okay because the bank in Kazakhstan said it was okay. And we have to be a little bit more smart uh, when, when dealing with this kind of information. Of course, a bank in a kleptocracy isn't going to say anything bad about what the daughter and grandson of the president are, 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 are doing. Uh, and what was particularly degalling was the unexplained wealth order was brought in to try and counteract the fact that we can't get evidence from these, we can't trust evidence from these countries. And yet in the very first case, we have a judge in the high court saying, well, Kazakhstan, the, the, the prosecutor's office and, and the banks that they've said, all well, this is, this is, this is fine. Um, so it's back to the drawing board with the unexplained wealth order, I'm afraid. We were promised 20 cases uh, a year. There's been four so far and none since 2019. So I think we really need to as I say, go back to the uh, drawing board. And uh, that's it, it for me for now. Thanks, Tom. Uh, that's great. Uh, dealing with the real estate com component of the, the report, uh, much of that's across um, chapter three of the report. So we're moving progressively through the report. And uh, uh, the final substantive chapter before the conclusion focuses very much on reputation laundering. And I'm going to hand over now to Dr. Senna Prelek from University of Oxford, who's going to talk a little about that. 
Thank you, John, and good afternoon, everybody. So I'll start from a somewhat different angle, religion, and specifically indulgences. In exchange for certain activities, such as prayers or pilgrimages, a Catholic believer can receive an indulgence, which reduces or erases that punishment instantly, without uh, no formal need for ceremony or sacrament. Indulgences emerged in the 11th and 12th century, when the idea of a purgatory started to take hold. Initially, they were promised to crusaders to encourage their participation in crusades to free the Holy Land, but they soon started to be given in exchange for monetary compensation. There are partial indulgences, which reduce purgatorial time by a certain number of days or months or years, and plenary indulgences, which eliminate all of it until another sin is committed. Reputation laundering is akin to this. The bigger the donation, the greater the redemption. I should mention that this parallel is not my original idea, uh, but a thought that was shared with me by an interviewee and friend who takes a completely different position on the issue of reputation laundering than I do. In his own words, commenting on a recent uh, philanthropic donation that was in the news, is it possible to become a billionaire in one party Vietnam without partnering with a minister or a general? No, of course not. But that is their culture, their laws, their problem. All we have to do here is to cash the check. I just find that this parallel with indulgences is even more compelling, as it shows that the proponents of considering this process legitimate are actually well aware of the fact that what it constitutes in reality is a remittance of sins in exchange for money. And it also reflects a wider issue uh, that we point out in the report and that was uh, aptly summarized uh, in today's Guardian write-up by Patrick Wintour. And I quote, um, if the original country is itself a kleptocracy, the activity is unlikely to have been deemed illegal. So we show how this is true for the unexplained wealth orders, as Tom has just explained, but as we see, it also applies to reputation laundering. And reputation laundering is indeed crucial to the kleptocrats' playbook because the ultimate success of kleptocracy relies on the perpetrators being hidden in plain sight. So how do you do that? How do you hide a crime in plain sight? By seeking the right type of publicity. What happens when you do so is that the practices that led to the illegal accumulation of money are obscured, they're hidden, while their perpetrators of these practices are magically turned into engaged global citizens. And it is exactly this rebranding of an unsavory past that is the essence of reputation laundering. I think it's really important to highlight that the risks that are posed by such rebranding are not purely cosmetic. They extend beyond the immediate perpetrators, causing wider societal damage. As with money laundering uh, and its consequences for skyrocketing wealth inequality that are rightly often highlighted, the reach of tainted money used to launder reputations is indeed pervasive. It can go as far as to influence and distort intellectual inquiry, public opinion, and even political choices in the cases in which kleptocrats cozy up to our politicians or indeed our royals. So the reputation launderer's toolkit has expanded and has been refined with time. Authoritarian governments have long been apt in using a range of repressive tactics to suppress and muffle criticism in their home countries. And they have progressively transnationalized such tactics and such practices in line with globalization. In the report, we highlight several areas of uh, activity in this sense. We mentioned, for instance, the role of uh, PR firms, of wealth managers, of surveillance and private investigation companies, et cetera, et cetera. Crucial is also the role of UK courts through libel actions, John mentioned libel tourism, and slap suits, um, that is strategic lawsuits against public participation. A case in point is uh, that is these days in the news is uh, Catherine Belton's excellent book um, on, uh, on Putin's regime in Russia. So Catherine and her publisher Harper Collins have been sued in relation to this book. Um, and uh, just yesterday, a group of free speech organizations uh, have uh, rightly sounded the alarm bell 
uh, as such lawsuit really have all the hallmarks of these slaps. Um, I quote, they write, these uh, lawsuits are used to drain their targets of as much time, money, and energy as possible in order to bully them into silence. Finally, I will now briefly elaborate on an area that uh, um, we think is pressing for the UK to consider. And it is the area of philanthropic donations to charities, think tanks, and universities. Our research in this area has focused on the procedures in place for universities to vet gifts. We found that while some improvements were made, uh, especially in the wake of the LSE Gaddafi scandal that uh, emerged over a decade ago, there are still very considerable shortcomings. Um, we interviewed and we surveyed Russell Group universities, which were kind enough to speak to us, I have to say. Um, but what we found is that only seven out of these 24 um, universities actually have uh, two very important tenets of the Wolf Report that was uh, uh, written uh, in the wake of the Alessi Gaddafi scandal. So the uh, only seven out of 24 universities have them in place. Uh, and these two tenants are the transparency of the guidelines, so for everybody to know exactly what is the decision-making process. And secondly, a truly independent gifts committee that vets such donations. Furthermore, the really thorny issue is that in the UK, there is no transparency of reporting of donations, none whatsoever. There is no requirement. And it is very difficult indeed to get to the bottom of uh, who has given which amount of money, what is the source of funds, et cetera, et cetera. We need to go through freedom of information requests every time. And as we found out during our research, we might not get anywhere anyway. Uh, it is also important to highlight that this is also um, really uh, facilitated by an internal vulnerability of the UK. So this huge increase of private gifts to universities that we have seen over the past decade, um, a considerable amount of which comes to China, but not only, is indeed compounded by the marketization of the higher education sector, um, due to which universities are increasingly pushed to look for funds from private donors. So what should happen to turn the tide? We argue for regulation as a central issue to work on. Uh, in relation to universities, we proposed, uh, also John and I are part of the Academic Freedom and Internationalization Working Group, we have uh, proposed the code of conduct um, as a bottom-up approach for universities to regulate such issues um, within, them, uh, within their institutions and really as a conversation that happens from the ground up. But there is indeed also a need for the top-down type of approach for statutory requirements to really get to the bottom of this transparency of reporting. But regulation is not enough. We also need to work on the norms, on the culture, on how accepted this is in our society. Until reputation laundering is not considered as immoral as we today consider monetary indulgences for the remittance of sins, the problem will not go away. We need to raise awareness and make the case that reputation laundering is indeed as unethical as indulgences are. I hope I've convinced you today that this is precisely the case. Thank you. Back to you, John. Thanks, Tena. And that's very important. Uh, one of the recommendations coming out of our report. A round of applause. Yeah. We've been so much. We've been so much in the tunnel of our research. Um, it's great to have the opportunity to, to recognize it publicly. What we've done here, I think, is focus on those elements of our research that have come out for our project. The report also covers the research of others and some excellent work, some of which is produced by some of the people in the audience here on issues that we haven't actually addressed today, including such things as um, investor visas and uh, what Tena touched on briefly, the aggressive reputation management and, and libel suits. So we have now around about half an hour for questions. It'd be great to focus those packs, particularly on the nature of the problem. We can begin to talk about recommendations as well. And there are 11 of those in the report. I've got one question online already and one question in the audience. I would like to encourage anyone online to, to put questions in the chat and we'll read those out. Uh, I will take first a question from the audience. And I'd like to ask you to introduce yourself first. Uh, yes, that's right, you're there, that's fine. The mic's just coming to you. Um, yes. Um, thank you very much. Um, the name's uh, Ewan Grant. Um, I was the um, 
uh, in the former UK Customs Service, I was the intelligence analyst for transnational organized crime and the ex-Soviet states, and a lot of my work has been in those countries since, not Russia. My question is regarding um, the institutions, using that widely, including the universities who you approached. Um, have they been given sort of advanced sight of the report to comment, or have they been given sort of ideas about what's going to be said? And what was their reaction, um, particularly if, which is probably a big if at the moment, you were able to see them face to face? Uh, what was the body language, um, given that you're implicitly begging the question about possible criticisms, particularly perhaps on donations? Okay, great. Thank you. I'm, I see other people. I'm going to collect some more from the audience in a moment. We've got a whole bunch that have come in online. So I'll go to Anna next after we've had these. And there's different ones for different of my colleagues to, to pick up on. Uh, first of all, Alex Folks says, uh, the comment about reputation laundering is very welcome. Would any of the panel be able to comment on those who do so via political donations? Um, Tiana Yimala to speak to that. Ajahn Shashianava, who I know is a researcher from Kyrgyzstan, it's a question that may go to Tom. Can a member of the public, foreign or British, or an NGO request that the National Crime Agency launch a UWO? Um, or can they do anything to bring to the attention of the British government um, kleptocrats who have arrived in the UK? Um, another one, maybe for Tom too, is from Graham Barrow. Is there a reason why account freezing orders seem to be more successful than UWOs? And then from Paul Amory, what is the best way to combat libel tourism and how best to prevent lawsuits such as that recently pursued against Catherine Belton and her publisher? Um, maybe I'll go to Anna as well for a, a sixth question. Uh, I, I think, well, yeah. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, so I actually have a very basic question. So why the UK is such a magnet? Or is it an exceptional magnet as compared, say, to other European countries or other, you know, de developed countries? Is it the English language? It's availability of services, it's a reputation, it's an access to other places. Um, yeah, what's special there? And um, of course, you know, Maxim Bakiev is something which is close to my heart in this case. Um, it's pretty notorious. It, is a lesson that we should draw from it, that if you have stole a lot of money out of your own country and managed to get on a plane, get to the UK and claim asylum, you are basically safe because it is very easy to make a case that if you are being extradited, you will be tortured, you will have an unfair trial. And that means that with a good lawyer and a good legal firm, uh, that case can continue indefinitely and you will be very safe in your Eaton Square townhouse and um, can't forget about it all. Thank you, Anna. I think Jason's going to take your first question and Ewan's question as well. And then we'll go in order with Tom on the uh, real estate focus questions and maybe Tanner on the reputation laundering ones. Jason. Uh, thank you. I mean, there's a lot in the questions. I know we're short of time and have a lot of questions. So forgive me if the answers are kind of brief, brief and superficial. I think the UK is special. Um, not quite singular, but special. I think that when it comes to hosting the proceeds of kleptocracy and enabling that, then really there are maybe three or four countries um, that stand on their own, the UK, the US, um, Switzerland and France, probably. Now, there are other countries that host as well. Um, but as I say, it's sort of the competition you don't want to win. Um, Britain is in the top league of kleptocracy enablers, I think partly for the reasons you suggest, um, the incredible concentration of financial services, um, ironically, um, rule of law and security of property. If you've taken the trouble to steal all that stuff, you don't want someone else stealing it from you. Um, but also the opportunities for conspicuous consumption um, class of professional services, but also probably less relevant for the Eurasia, but more relevant in terms of, say, Africa, uh, former colonial linkages as well. Um, there is this thing of Francophone kleptocrats tend to gravitate in France, Anglophone kleptocrats tend to gravitate um, in London and so on. Um, so as I say, I think there is something special about the UK, special about London um, in particular uh, when it comes to this phenomenon. Uh, in terms of the universities uh, and fundraising, um, speaking as a 
former head of department at Cambridge, I know it's a pretty it's a pretty vexed issue. Uh, I don't think the re the report was embargoed until two thirty today, so the universities I think have not had the chance to see the final. But I can tell you it's something that they've been talking and thinking about a lot. I don't think they've actually been doing as much as they should. Um, and as kind of Tenna mentioned in her presentation, up until comparatively recently, there's been not only very little transparency when it comes to the sources of donations to university, um, but surprisingly little pressure. Again, the big exception would be the Gaddafi LSE scandal. Uh, but frankly, universities get far fewer scandals than they probably deserve, uh, including my own, uh, given the type of person from whom they accept donations. There's more I could say, but I'll, I'll leave it there in the interest of time. Thanks, Thanks Jason. Tom. I think what you say about Bakiev is, 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 is correct, although I would caveat that by saying he had a very different experience compared to Mukhtar Blyazov, for, for example. Now, that's probably because, you know, the Blyazov case was bankrolled by, you know, millions and millions, unlimited funds of the, of, the, of the Kazakh government to pursue a Blyazov, whereas the Kyrgyz Republic didn't, didn't, didn't have uh, that, that funds available to them, whereas Bakiev, of course, did have funds to fund a rather uh, sturdy uh, defence. Uh, and I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's basically saying if the rule of law is slightly iffy in my country, I can steal a lot of money, fl uh, fly to a, a country, claim it's all politically motivated, and then uh, continue to, to reap the benefits. Yes, some money was frozen by the United States, but I think there was probably a lot more uh, from, from, from where that came from. And we need a way of trying to to, to, to deal with to deal with that, um, maybe we don't send them back to Kyrgyzstan. Maybe we, you know, issue some kind of um, you know legal proceedings here. There has to be more questioning of the information that that we 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 get here. Um, the question about the why is the unexplained why is the account freezing order working so much better than unexplained wealth order? Um, yeah the, yeah, the account freezing order is, is, is what the one bright spark I would see in, in, in anti-corruption efforts uh, in the last few years. Perhaps it's easier to say, why have the unexplained wealth orders uh, failed? And I think that's just because they're, 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 they're set up wrongly. They have a provision, a couple of provisions inside of the, the legislation, one of which is um, the activity is, is, is legal if in the country of origin it's deemed to be to be to be legal. Uh, this is um, in contrast to the UK bribery law, which basically says it doesn't matter if, if bribery, for example, is, is illegal in country X. What's important is that we're saying it's illegal, and so we can prosecute where, you where, uh, wherever, wherever you've, you've bribed someone. Uh, this is different in the unexplained wealth orders. And there's also this rather strange provision in the unexplained wealth order about if you purport to comply with the order, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to count, and there doesn't seem to be much explanation about what purporting to apply means. So if you have a, a reasonable attempt at, apply, uh, at responding to one of these orders, it's basically counted as, as compliance, and then the NCA loses that presumption that the uh, property is, is, is bought with the uh, proceeds of, 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 of crime. Um, so that's why an excellent wealth orders have, have, fa have, 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 have failed. Um, on the National Crime Agency, I'm, I'm sure, I'm, I guess you could write to the National Crime Agency with evidence if you suspect you have uh, found a, a property that's, 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 that's bought with uh, unexplained wealth. I'm not sure how far it will get you. And this is one of the things, again, to go back to what I was saying in, in, in my speech, how, you know, as a, as a, as a researcher, it, you know, when the United States, um, you know, goes after someone, you have this wealth of information from the Department of Justice, from the indictments of Karimova I mentioned, and we can point to how the scheme seems to have been uh, perpetrated. Here, we're, we're kind of blindly, you know, moving around, not knowing what's happening, uh, which cases are being investigated. Uh, the cream of a case, because it's a serious fraud office case, you know, I, 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 I phone them up, can't say anything about the case, in massive contrast to, to what's released by the, by the, United, the United States. Um, but yeah, please write to the National Crime Agency with information, I guess. All information's good information. That's good for now. We've got many, many more, at least 13 more online. Uh, Tenna. Um, to Ewan's point about how universities reacted and what we contacted them. So um, we did this research, uh, John, Tom, uh, Alexander Cooley uh, and I, 
for originally for the National Endowment of Democracy, and um, uh, all this info was contained, or part of this information was contained in a report for the NED that was published in May. Uh, so we did contact them in relation to that report, and they were, I think, on the whole, you know, pleased that they could say that they were tr transparent uh, enough with us. So that there was, um, in that sense, uh, a good. Uh, a good relationship and really I want to thank all the gift managers who spoke to us because they, they showed, you know, uh, uh, that uh, they're willing to be transparent. Um, I would say, you know, something that was uh, that was crucial, I think, and, uh, and a recurrent theme when we're speaking to them via Zoom or uh, Teams, so we didn't have, uh, uh, you know, in-person contact, no body language, but we did see them. Um, was uh, the issue of the of maintaining the reputation intact of their institution. So it was, you know, they are uh, concerned about this whole process, but it is more to keep the, um, well, the facade, the reputation of the institution there, rather than due to some sort of deep held, you know, uh, willingness to do the right thing. And I think this proves the point of what, you know, we're, we're arguing for, which is that we do need more regulation. Otherwise, it's not going to change uh, uh, substantially. Uh, then about the point of uh, political donations that was uh, made by uh, um, an online uh, guest. Um, of course, you know, uh, we had the issue of um, Russian donations. It was uh, very much uh, um, the news uh, last year. But I also think that um, uh, these issues that are interconnected, uh, absolutely, also tells us a lot about our democracy and our, you know, um, way of uh, of dealing with uh, with things. Because it's not only about donations coming from authoritarian countries. It's obviously, you know, about cronies that are, can be also very much uh, domestic. Um, I would say, you know, the thing to note is that really they are so philanthropic giving, political donations, all these various areas are very much interconnected. And perhaps the example number one uh, in terms of a country that uh, has, you know, the full palette on display is Azerbaijan. Um, about a decade ago, we had those reports by ESSI on caviar diplomacy, showing the, you know, huge extent of um, the political influencing of Azerbaijan in the Council of Europe. Uh, really through, you know, plain bribes, uh, high cor grand corruption. Um, and uh, we've seen, you know, uh, also their investment in education has gone up alongside with their investment in real estate in the UK. From the Pandora Papers, we know that up to 700 million pounds are owned by the Azerbaijani elite in real estate in, in London. And we saw um, that uh, one of uh, a politician who sits on a board of a charity that has invested in, uh, um, in you know, philanthropic donations to universities has actually argued in parliament, um, uh, has used his position to argue for Azerbaijan, for the UK to stand with Azerbaijan in the Nagorno-Karabakh case. So you can see how, you know, these areas are, are indeed closely related one to the other. Thanks, Tena. I am going to go through some of the online questions now and then open it up to the floor for some more questions from there. We have a total of 20 online. It's quite a task for me because only I can see the questions. Uh, for Tom, examples of asset recovery success, not really something we touch upon in the report, but I know it's something you know something about. Also, Jason may like to speak to that one. Um, National Crime Agency, how, does it, how can it be improved? Is it about leadership? Is it about funding? Um, again, Jason and Tom may both like to speak to that one. How can you unexplained wealth orders be improved? Another one for you, Tom, there. Um, and uh, John Binns uh, asked the question of that, that unexplained wealth orders are designed for places where, for cases where the act is unlawful, both in the UK and in the country of origin. Are we suggesting that the second of those conditions, the unlawfulness in the country of origin, doesn't need to be met? It's not quite what we're suggesting, so you might not want to clarify on that. Um, Jason, questions on uh, political will. Is there a big question here of political will and its absence? And also, do, question, do cases like that of Jeffrey Cox suggest that involvement with, in businesses with in offshore sectors is normalized? And that suggests there's a problem at the political top, really, there. Uh, for Tena, um, the question of with reputation laundering, is it that or yeah, the broader reputational area, is it, the, is it the case that the UK tolerates more than other countries? Or is it simply we tolerate the same amount, but the enabling here is better? That's from Oliver Buller. 
um, uh, why, you know, my, why would universities accept such funding given that it doesn't come to the individuals directly but to the institutions? Um, and uh, from Nick McGoran, University of Newcastle, are Confucius Institutes an example, example of reputation laundering? So an interesting question there about reputation laundering at the state level as opposed to the level of the individual. Um, there, are, there are many more coming in, but I also want to give you some thinking time. And there's a couple of online questions I'll take. Before that, I'm gonna collect some questions from, from the audience. Franz. Uh, hi, I'm Franz Wild. I'm a journalist. Um, uh, I was wondering whether, I mean, it's it sort of affects all three of you or four of you differently, but I was wondering whether over the last couple of years in your research, you'd observed the change in terms of the source of, of funds or, or people uh, by, by region. I don't know, is there more people from Middle East or China or whatever it is? And, and also to what extent uh, you think that the, the Brexit effect and possibly the pandemic effect has kind of meant that London has become less of a destination, if at all. Paul Hayward, University of Nottingham. Um, so a question for, for the whole panel. The, uh, a lot of what you've been talking about is very much in regard to responses to approaches. Um, and you've shown how, in terms of the actions of enablers, it has allowed people to deposit their, their wealth and, and buy services and goods, et cetera, as well as try to launder reputation. But to, to what extent, if at all, have you explored the enablers, so-called, in the legal profession, in the banks, in real estate, et cetera, being proactive in actually seeking to attract some of this money? Are, are, are they selling themselves as being very effective in this domain, or are they simply waiting for people to come to them? Great question. Thank you. Uh, Annette, and there's a question over here. I think that will be the last one. The Netball Russia Asian Program, Chatham House. Tom, one of the things that struck me in your presentation was when you noted that the FATF failed to uh, note countries of concern, such as Azerbaijan, Russia, and Turkmenistan. Is this some sort of just unbelievable um, naive oversight? Is there, or is there something more suspicious? And perhaps, John, you might have something to say to that as well. I know you'll be speculating, but nonetheless. Thanks, uh, Sam Green from, from King's College London. Um, a quick question about how this all fits together, right? Because I think there's there's, there's some stuff in, in what you've said in, in, in the summary document that's available, right, that, that suggests that that this is a lot of this is down to political will, right? Um, and that have you know even with great laws on the books, right, that they're, they're not being implemented. Other things that there's a very concrete proposals for things to change in, in the law, right? Um, do we think is there reason to believe that making those changes is actually going to to alter the calculation and and overcome the political will issues, right? What what might give us that that confidence? But also where where the reputation comes in because. One might get the impression that the reputation story is, is, is a separate story, linked in, in the characters that are involved, right? Um, but separate from a, a, a cause and effect perspective. And I'm wondering whether or not you think that um, the failure to tackle the reputation laundering issue is in itself an impediment to, uh, uh, to solving the political will and, and the legal efficacy issues. Mm, that's a great question. Thank you. And as I'm going to give my colleagues a little bit of thinking time on those. Uh, there's two other questions that came in online, which I'll have a go at. <laughs> One was on uh, dualism in UK policy on Russia between a tough approach on traditional national security issues, one could think of many, um, versus a very easy approach on Russians, uh, Russian oligarchs and kleptocrats in London. Um, and the second question was on whether if the UK takes a tougher stance on this issue, there is a risk that it will be disproportionately targeted towards political exiles and not the incumbents, who are the large part, in fact, according to the evidence, evidence we've gleaned of, of the problem in London. So just on the first one, um, my thoughts on that would be somewhat speculative, but it does seem that all states have been behind on this and that the UK for many years has been in this position where it's conceived of foreign policy in these very narrow and traditional terms and failed to bring these questions of kleptocracy and anti-kleptocracy into that foreign policy. It's thought of diplomacy and military affairs as, as being primary and not seen how if a government is in fact a regime, a cabal of elites, then their primary interests 
and I think this may be true for a number of Eurasian states, are not necessarily public interests, they're private interests for those individuals. It seems for me what's quite interesting is the move of the Biden administration this year at least nods towards the fact that there is a need to develop national strategy which addresses kleptocracy as well as addressing the traditional security threats. Maybe the US is leading on that right now because it has superpower status which the UK lacks, but it seems to me unsustainable for the UK to continue a position where it doesn't seek to harmonize or achieve a certain amount of consistency between how it deals with elites and how it deals with governments. I think that's a really interesting question. On the incumbents versus elites, and that's already happening very much. So the work we've done, and we bring this out briefly in the report, suggests that the only people who are really at risk of having their assets frozen in the UK are political exiles. Incumbents, especially incumbents of friendly states, partner states, states with which the UK is part of some wider partnership agreement in the past, that would have been through the European Union, but now with all those wonderful trade agreements that Liz, Liz Truss uh, organized in her previous role, um, if you are an incumbent from those states, you are pretty much fine. And there's very few, and in our database, no cases of such incumbents facing. So that is the risk right now. So there needs to be a change from that present situation to one where incumbents are actually bound by the rule of law. And for me, that's one of the clearest indications that this is a rule of law matter because if the rule of law was operative here, there wouldn't be such a clear distinction between political exiles who may get into trouble and incumbents who never do. That is the exercise of power that leads to that outcome, not the rule of law. Okay, we have 10 minutes left and uh, my colleagues have an awful lot to, to go with. Uh, Jason, you guys have got three, three minutes, 20 seconds each maybe. Well, okay, well, I'll be selective and apologies for not addressing all of these great questions. I think partly in response to the questions here, but the previous round, I mean, one of the countries that's gone from worst to perhaps much better than it was is actually France in terms of asset recovery. Um, and there the running has actually been made by NGOs and private citizens um, against the will of the French state. Um, in fact, they've had some very big successes uh, against Theodore and Obiang um, and against the uncle of Bashir, uh, Bashir al-Assad. I think in terms of the problems of the NCA, Tom will probably know more about this than I do. I don't actually believe in political will because it's a bit like kind of fairy godmother at saying, well, this policy would work if we just had political will is like saying this policy would work as long as we had everything. It doesn't really explain why things work and why things don't work. I think more practically for the NCA, in British law enforcement, as with many other countries, your career goes a lot better if you don't actually investigate crime. Investigating crime is pretty much a career risk because if you get it right, you get a small bonus. If you get it wrong, you get a really big penalty. If you freeze someone's assets and then they overturn it in the court and get it unfrozen, big black mark. So I think it's less to do with political will and much more to do with bureaucratic incentives for police and prosecutors um, in the UK, but also in many other countries as well. And I think political will is really too ephemeral to, to, to get at that. Um, lastly, in terms of, of trends, I think uh, if there's a new country that's kind of on the scene in terms of hosting kleptocratic wealth, that would definitely be Dubai uh, making a strong run. Um, I don't actually think Brexit makes that much of a difference because most of the people shipping themselves or their families or their money um, are comparatively not so worried about Britain's access to the EU. You can always buy a house in Paris if that's the thing you want to do. Um, so the pandemic, um, I'm too soon to tell, I think, I'm not really sure. And in terms of Paul's question about um, the enablers, are they just kind of sitting back and waiting for the business to come to them? I think the kind of best evidence of proactive in terms of enablers, particularly banks, um, are the excellent reports released by the US Permanent Subcommittee on Investigation, which looked at particularly the activities of the Swiss banks uh, in terms of going out there and actually actively recruiting uh, in these very, very high risk jurisdictions. I'll leave it there again. I know there's more out there. Fantastic, Jason. Thank you. Tom. Uh, just briefly on the asset recovery question, uh, I read a report it's comparing two different asset recoveries um, uh, regarding Kazakh funds. Um, uh, one was the Botar Foundation, which did cost a lot of money because Western uh, NGOs were involved, but I think it was, was a much more successful asset recovery program because it, it just removed any political interference whatsoever. In contrast to this, uh, a few years later, there was 
a asset recovery program that just basically sent the money back to to Kazakhstan with with, with fewer checks, and it and it went to um, you know pro Nazarbayev uh, youth youth parties, uh, and yeah, it is a thorny question because you know when you you recover money, you're sending it back basically to the same uh, kleptocrats. Um, on unexplained wealth orders, um, on the lawful versus unlawful question, we just need more questioning of 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 the information uh, coming out from 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 kleptocracies. Um, so in, in the case that uh, I mentioned, I think the NCA did an awful job at, at, at trying to, to make their case. They could have got expert witness testimony in to explain the concept of political economy and how we, we, we can't trust some of this information coming out from the other side. They, they chose not to do that for, or whatever, for, for whatever reason. Um, how can they be improved? Well, all these things I've been been talking about, they can only really, I think, succeed at the moment if somebody just fails to respond completely. That's the only the only chance they have of, of succeeding, it looks like. But there are, as I say, little improvements they could do about this purport to comply uh, um, uh, clause. Um, at the moment also, I think the NCA is liable for the costs if they 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 lose. And in the Nazarbayeva case, I think they got billed you know, $1.5 million, which kind of blew the entire, NCA budget for, for unexplained wealth orders. Um, why was that provision in there? Usually NCA are only liable if they could be if they're shown to be to be negligent. So that needs to that needs to be um, changed. Um, on Annette's question about the money laundering lords, I think there are two components to this. First is FATF is looking at very specific uh, you know, requirements of are you applying these money laundering laws correctly? Um, and countries like Kazakhstan will technically have strong anti-money laundering laws on the books. It's just that if you're a politically exposed person, you can just flout them and no one's going to, 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 to care. Uh, but I think there is also definitely a political aspect going on here, and there have been kind of fights with the EU's high-risk third country lists. I think there was, Jason, you might know this better than me, I think there was a, a kind of a push to put maybe Nigeria and Saudi Arabia on there, but then there was a lot of uh, argy bargy and they surprisingly ended up not on the list so you know you're not going to put Russia on that list for various reasons so that I think comes comes into it and and you know it is it is kind of strange when you know we're we're, we're trying to state that Jamaica is a, is a is a is a risk to the EU's financial system and, and yet as you've pointed out Jason we've got way more billions of, of, of dirty money flowing through uh, through our banks um I think maybe that's it. <laughs> uh, yes, to Oliver Bellow's question, um, does the UK tolerate more reputation laundering or is it uh, is the enabling better? So I would say uh, that, uh, as I mentioned in my introductory remarks, uh, it's crucial to seek the right publicity. And in that sense, for reputation launderers, the more high sounding the name, the better. And that's why there is merit in uh, analyzing what happens in the UK and the US in terms of philanthropic donations to universities, because obviously they are renowned in the whole world. But this doesn't mean that it also that it doesn't happen uh, as somewhere else as well. And in a way, what we wanted to do with that uh, with our research was also to sound an alarm bell to other uh, higher education institutions and systems that are uh, progressively privatizing their, their system of funding, because this might be coming there too. Um, but of course, the enabling is brought to stardom level. You have a very tight knit industry that, that comes together. And London is just a great place to be and a great place to hide in plain sight. I mean, here we are discussing about kleptocracy and just around the corner, there are the lawyers who have uh, uh, signed off on uh, Milo Djukanovic's uh, shell companies and uh, around the corner we have, I don't know, Azerbaijani property, et cetera, et cetera, you name it. So we are bang in the middle of it. It's really the place to hide in plain sight. Reputation laundering at state level, um, important point, I mentioned uh, Azerbaijan already. Um, another um, instance to mention uh, would probably be the Confucius Institutes as an example of uh, how to steer the narrative through such uh, dynamics. And so I would say that definitely China is one of the countries that we've seen also, you know, increasing their, their presence in that sense and their investment. And I completely agree with, uh, um, with Jason about Dubai and the role that Dubai is increasingly playing in these dynamics um, at wider level. And in that sense, uh, a worm uh, recommendation to read uh, uh, Matthew Page's and Jody Vittori's uh, report on, on, this, on this matter. And finally, about the Brexit event, uh, effect that uh, Franz uh, mentioned. Uh, so the question was, is London less of a destination due to Brexit? I'm afraid to say that in certain respects, it's actually 
more so that Brexit has made some of these issues um, more difficult to tackle. For instance, in the area of um, uh, donations to universities, after the Brexit vote, so not even after Brexit, but just after the Brexit vote in the first six months, if I'm not mistaken, uh, UK universities received uh, up to 500 million euros less in public funding. So that tells you that you know, this money will have to be replaced somehow and uh, probably with private funding. Back to you, John. Okay, thank you, everyone. We've ranged very widely indeed. And I think you'll probably have gathered from this that when we talk about the UK's kleptocracy problem with, response, with respect to post-Soviet elites, there's a much broader context here. This is not a specific thing to the former Soviet Union. It's part of a global problem. The UK is by no means the only center, although the UK's relationship with the post-Soviet world is an extremely, I think we'll say an extreme case, which really shines a light on this problem. Uh, perhaps I would close by just referring to one question online that we didn't have time to tackle earlier, which is a question of, uh, this is from Vivyar Luby. Uh, Western powers promised that there would be severe economic consequences if Russia continues with its aggression. Capital flight is a big problem for Russia. A lot of it lands in the UK and London. What is your concrete suggestion to the British government of how to handle that? Um, so one suggestion with regard to those who are sending the capital flight could be, and that's recommendation seven of the nine, uh, to use the new global anti-corruption sanctions regime against such individuals. But there are a number of things that are very much about UK uh, domestic measures as well. And the first three of our recommendations are these, mandatory reporting to a state agency of politically, politically exposed person transactions over a certain monetary value. Secondly, a requirement for UK registered companies to have at least one UK citizen resident as an officer with this person being bearing liability for impropriety. And thirdly, investigation of and penalties for those who submit fraudulent information to companies' house. I would suggest that if those recommendations are followed through on, then capital flight would be fairly dramatically reduced. So we have ended our first session. We are about to take a short break. But before that, we're going to, um, I guess, uh, provide our argument to you in slightly different form, which is in, in the form of film, uh, a very short film of less than three minutes that was made as a kind of capstone to this research project, which uh, the paper is, is a part of. So we'll very shortly go to that film, then there'll be a short two minute break to change around uh, the panelists and a comfort break for anyone who needs it. But before we do go to the film, I'd just like to thank my colleagues uh, for a very intense session. London is a prime destination for corrupt government officials from low-income countries looking to hide their ill-gotten wealth and bypass global anti-money laundering rules. After they've stripped their countries of valuable resources, a hidden system of enablers allows these kleptocrats to launder their money and whitewash their reputations, often without consequences. According to research from the Global Integrity Anti-Corruption Evidence Program, which brings together academic research from around the world, these enablers cover a wide range of professional capabilities. Some are actively complicit, while others are passively negligent. Bankers and other financial service providers set up private accounts and shell companies that conceal their origins. Even reputable financial institutions do not assess actual risks of money laundering from clients associated with authoritarian regimes and terrorist financing. Real estate agents help them anonymously stash their suspicious wealth in luxury property. For example, between 2005 and 2017, agents helped high-risk clients from Kazakhstan buy over 500 million pounds of luxury property in London via offshore companies. Universities and foundations accept their donations in secret and often without robust checks into their origins, potentially allowing kleptocrats to buy influence and prestige. Just seven out of 24 elite UK Russell Group universities report having independent gift committees and public ethics criteria, while none publish details of donations. Enablers open the gates to corruption and facilitate capital flight from some of the world's poorest nations. Lax laws and enforcement, inadequate resources, and limited oversight make this all possible. 
Policy changes can help fight this corruption. We need better funding of the UK's National Crime Agency with a clear mandate to investigate and prosecute enablers of corruption. Enablers who look the other way by failing to report money laundering suspicions should also face punishment and fines. Lastly, we need a specific legal requirement for universities to report the donor identities and the purpose of donations. The UK cannot stop kleptocratic regimes from stealing their people's money, but we can better regulate the professional enablers who help them become global elites. To learn more about this research and ways you can help, visit ace.globalintegrity.org. Welcome back, everybody. The last question was a great segue to this session because we're going to be talking about the practical measures to be taken in even more detail um, with some practitioners, in fact. Um, perhaps I could just say, even before that, that um, uh, this paper is available now online. If you'd like a hard copy, just get in touch and, and we'll send it to you, of course. Um, anyway, here's a plan for the next, uh, well, what, 50 minutes now. Um, perhaps, uh, um, what we'll do uh, is, as I say, we'll concentrate on the recommendations and the solutions. Um, uh, the proposed anti-kleptocracy strategy found at the end of this report, the nine points that John just mentioned, he read out the first three of them. I won't read them out. Perhaps you want to take a look at them now since it's pasted online for you. Um, but we'll, we'll do this in a, in, in a couple of ways. First of all, um, Alexander Cooley, um, Professor of Political Science uh, and Director of the Harriman Institute at Columbia University in New York and a member of the uh, Academy adjunct fa uh, faculty at Chatham House and last but not least a co-author of this report. Um, we'll speak about the lessons learned, um, the US experience in particular um, with its anti-corruption strategy I suppose and, it being and it classifying corruption as a national security threat now in contrast to the UK I suppose I might say, although Alex may disagree with that, I don't, I don't know. Um, then Catherine West MP, uh, Shadow Minister for Asia and the Pacific, uh, will say a few words about the problem we've been hearing uh, about, the paper itself hopefully, and uh, I'm sure something about Labour's own anti-corruption plan. And then last but not least, we'll hear from Ed Lucas to my, to my left here, uh, here in person, so I don't feel like a total idiot on stage. And, um, and really, obviously, one of the great uh, one of the great Russia specialists, let's be honest, um, uh, but now in his latest guise, uh, Liberal Democrat candidate for the cities of London and for Westminster. Um, now I must say, finally, that we did invite to represent, uh, we did invite representatives from uh, the Conservative Party, two of them, from a, from, a, from a liberal wing, I suppose I might say, with whom, say, Catherine and Ed might have a lot in common as far as this is concerned, but they, they didn't actually respond, where well, perhaps you heard all you need to know this morning from Liz Truss, as we said, when she said that we have the toughest anti-corruption laws in the world, and that was the end of that, I'm afraid. Um, okay, enough. Um, I hope you can hear me, uh, Alex and Catherine, but we'll go to you, Alex, if I may first. Yeah, so thanks Thanks so much. It's It's been a, a pleasure and a privilege to be involved in this um, in this initiative, I want to make a few comparative comments and observations regarding the U.S. James, you timed the launch of this report perfectly uh, because on Monday, uh, indeed, the U.S. Uh, the White House did release the new United States strategy on countering corruption. Um, this is a follow-up document that's in the wake of uh, the June two. 2021 National Security Study Memorandum 1 on establishing the fight against corruption as a core United States security, security interest, right? Elevating corruption up to the level of security concerns. Um, the main pillars of the U.S. strategy are modernizing, coordinating, and resourcing U.S. government efforts to fight corruption, domestically curbing illicit finance, holding corrupt actors accountable. Many of the service providers that we've talked about in the report are mentioned in the US version. Um, preserving and strengthening the multilateral uh, anti-corruption architecture and improving uh, diplomatic engagement on the issue, leveraging foreign assistance as well. I think there's two aspects of this that are particularly important. One is it's clear now that the Biden administration regards anti-corruption work as a key part of um, uh, the promotion of democracy and rule of law. Right, this is part of the package. It's not so much elections and voting any, anymore. And you'll see in the summit for democracy, anti-kleptocracy gets its own day, right? So, so they're, they're viewing as this as an integrated liberal values agenda. Two, uh, uh, there are parts of the report that talk about uh, the importance of uh, countering kleptocracy um, as a strategic issue, right? as a strategic concern. Uh, and this is especially important uh, uh, when, when, when 
we use the phrase the weaponization of corruption, right? The strategic use of corruption on behalf of some states to further their national interests. So I think those two dimensions are important. The second point I wanna make um, is about why study Western enablers both here in the UK and the US. Well, I think it's fair to say that the democracy promotion and rule of rights promotion agenda has foundered in the post-communist world. And part of it um, uh, is that it's, it's vulnerable to accusations of hypocrisy, especially here in the United States after events like January the 6th, right? You tell all of us post-communist countries to do one thing and, and look at the shortfalls you have in your democratic governments, in respect of the rule of law, in your human rights safeguards. I think we confront potentially similar situation with anti-corruption work if we don't sort out this domestic piece. So it's absolutely critical for foreign policy that is going to integrate counter-corruption um, to be viewed as making uh, important substantive uh, progress on both the legislative side and the enforcement side, as well as the normative side, on these domestic enablers. Here, um, it's a little more general, and there are many different types of legislation uh, pending, uh, measures on beneficial ownership, curbing real estate transaction. Um, there's talk of increasing reporting requirements uh, by hedge fund managers that have been a carve out in the loophole, um, but we'll wait and see. And the report talks about working with Congress to increase scrutiny. Um, but this domestic element is absolutely critical to avoid these kinds of charges of hypocrisy. The third point I wanna make is what does it mean to actually integrate counter corruption work into foreign policy? Here, the report I think is less specific. Um, I think the model as John talked about in his comments before used to be that there used to be a wall of separation between rule of law work, anti-corruption work on the one hand and diplomacy. I'm reminded of the Kazakh gate scandal uh, under uh, President Bush where uh, the Kazakhs were quite upset about this, including then President Nazarbayev himself. And he made repeated overtures to the White House uh, and said, can't you just make this go away? Can't you take care of this? Ours is an important relationship. And the response he would get actually to the Bush's credit was, no, this is completely separate. The Department of Justice deals with the Kazakh gate indictment and we don't interfere in their affairs. That is what the rule of law here is. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is integrating uh, counter kleptocracy and counter corruption with foreign policy. That's a different animal. Um, and it's going to require, I think, uh, much more strategic and complex thinking. Um, there's a couple of pitfalls. One is avoiding the crafting of the issue as values versus interests, right? As democracy issues came to be framed, especially by Eurasian elites, right? Do you want our military bases and our energy pipelines or do you want to spread your values, right? And we accept it. Uh, that framing. So we need to avoid that. Um, and also the issue that John raises is absolutely vital. We need to avoid being lured into uh, domestic political struggles uh, and having these anti-kleptocracy tools wielded against domestic political opponents or political opponents in exile. Um, um, that needs to be you know, carefully scrutinized because I think a lot of this counter kleptocracy, counter uh, kleptocracy work assumes good intentions, right? Uh, uh, and, and, and there is a scenario in the future under other US administrations uh, where uh, foreign rulers might want to take a shot at their uh, chief political rivals uh, and you know, give a packet of info to a US government. Let me just wrap up with this, uh, James. I think um, the question of whether we are um, dealing with countries that are primarily interested in regime stability or pursuing their national interests is at the analytical heart of this. John captured this very well. Um, and this also captures, I think, some of the tensions that we have regarding Russia policy and what should we do in response to a possible renewed intervention uh, against Ukraine. Those who view Russia as a kleptocracy say, uh, for instance, one thing to do in response, cut them off from SWIFT, uh, publicize Putin's offshore network of different types of holdings, go after them in terms of this kind of wealth and reputation uh, uh, dimension. Um, and then others see kleptocracy um, as a sideshow um, or as a secondary concern compared to the sort of higher stake security issues. I don't have a very good formulation for this. Hopefully other pan panelists do, but I do think we need to uh, sort of you know, be aware that integrating the regime perspective versus the sort of state interest perspective has to be part of the work that we do in taking 
uh, uh, counter kleptocracy and counter corruption work seriously. Thanks so much. Uh, no, thank you, Alex. And uh, what you just said to close with there is very much seems to be a part of the question asked in the previous session about the dualism of UK policy, with a, a tough stance on the one hand, as far as Ukraine is concerned, and uh, and, and this open door policy. But I'll come back to that. It's probably a question I'll ask for it. In the meantime, Catherine, Catherine West, thank you very much for joining us. Can you hear me? I can, Chair. Can Excellent. you hear me? Over, yes, we can. Over to you. Good. And thanks so much for inviting me. Um, this is a really um, very critical uh, to topic for us here in Parliament. And you're right to say that it is cross-party to some degree. Um, I know Tom Tugendhat has done a lot, for example, on sanctions and the um, powerful tool that sanctions can be in various um, uh, contexts. Uh, Lisa Nandy, who was the Shadow Foreign Secretary, announced uh, last September that there would be an illicit task force group which we would set up in opposition. And I do think in opposition one is perfectly positioned because, you know, you don't have the same connections, you're not sort of seeing people every day and therefore I think you can be quite purist in your approach, which I think is how democracies work, isn't it? Because um, we're hoping eventually to get in and have a plan for dealing with what we see as a problem. Um, and equally, we can be very free in what we say because um, we, we don't necessarily have to maintain the relationships in the same way that one does in government. Um, so this illicit task force, which we're setting up, will be looking at the question of the enablers, so um, finance and banking, um, accountancy and law, uh, mainly in the City of London, um, and then right across the piece as well, looking at government policy. So um, looking at why beneficial ownership is taking so long to come in, why the register for property owners is taking so long to come in, why the company's house reforms are taking an age to come in, what happened to the government's um, anti-corruption czar, which was set up under Theresa May, which seems to have gone very quiet in this parliament. So there's a lot the work that actually I think has been done um, but that isn't really joined up in a strategy and is, is not being pushed out by the government um, and so we hope that with our work in opposition through the illicit task force that some of this will actually end up coming to the fore because many of you would remember that in 2015 David Cameron actually did make a big effort on benefit official ownership and so on. Um, and I think quite a lot of progress was made then back around the, um, you know, the, some of the, the offshoring and so on of wealth. Um, and now we need to get back with that same zeal. Um, and I feel that we've lost that passion, which is why we want to do the illicit task force. Um, so the research paper, which is excellent, by the way, and um, seems to come to the same conclusion as Parliament's own Intelligence and Security Committee report, that basically the UK is still um, a comfortable home for dirty money um, and that this should not be tolerated um, and that what we need to do is to get on with the recommendations from the Russia report and the findings about what's called the London Laudromat um, and stop batting them away. Now, while the well, there does seem to be a block for some reason um, at government level around some of the measures which I just mentioned. Um, what we need to do as opposition MPs and indeed those who are, um, you know, in the same party as the government but are not in the government, is really just to keep pushing, um, particularly where we're worried about, for example, Russia. Um, and we know that uh, not just... Um, you know, that, that it goes across a number of different spheres. So, for example, on the information point or on the use of um, the migrants um, in Belarus, and um, that this is just another, that the financial aspect and the, and the kleptocracy aspect is just another sort of element of um, all the different ways in which um, our own democracy is really being challenged. Now, um, what we are hoping to do is um, not just agree with the Chatham House paper, but use it as a springboard into our task force in the new year. Um, and also very much uh, line it up with um, some of the national security concerns um, and look at how we can um, have some more practical recommendations, not just getting on with what the government's already promised to do around reform of companies, house the beneficial ownership registers and, and so on, but also interrogate um, the the sort of the enablers, the, the comfortable regime that sits around a lot of the kleptocracy, particularly in the London context, and challenge that and come up with some more fresh recommendations. Um, we also know that um, 
you know, and something which obviously as a London MP, I'm particularly concerned about, um, the way that there's the interplay with the property market and the amount of money that comes into London. Um, and I think now is really um, a really good time to talk about that as well with house prices continuing to go up and that sense that, you know, unless you're sort of over the age of 40, you may never ever get to have your own house. So I really do feel that it's well overdue to be looking at some of those wider implications. Um, and the other thing, of course, is, um, you know, all the people who work very hard in small business and so on, um, and yet there's really quite a, a high level of abuse of things like our company's house system and so on. Um, and, and yet when we do have an instrument, for example, the unexplained, unexplained wealth orders, there really haven't been many of those when you think um, how many there really could be. And um, as our previous speaker said, Alex said, it does, a lot of that is down to resourcing. Um, and that's the other thing that the illicit task force would seek to do from an opposition point of view is to, is to really work out how much some of this might cost um, and put that into practice. Uh, many of you will be aware of the work of Bill Browder um, and his recommendation is, or his suggestion, um, through the all party group for Magnitsky sanctions is to look at what does come through the system through the unexplained, unexplained wealth orders or what comes through through cracking down on some of these oligarchs could actually then be folded back into the NCO or the S, uh, um, SFO or any of the other officers which are carrying out that important work. Um, one final point chair is just really around culture. Um, and I was struck when Alex was talking about, um, you know, the role of Congress, also the role of Treasury, because, of course, in the US, I think the Treasury is a more campaigning kind of organisation, really, or certain people who, who have influence are willing to see it a little bit more in a campaigning or sort of political sense, whereas here, um, in a way, the Treasury is always the sort of, you know, it's small c conservative doesn't want to really be too ambitious i mean the furlough scheme was actually an exception to that because it was a tripartite arrangement between francis o'grady from the tuc rishi sunak and um, the treasury and therefore i think you did get a bit of a sense of something unusual and innovative but um i think we really do have to try and learn from the u.s picture and see whether there's more that we can do to become more campaigning and use um, the benefit of the City of London, um, you know, to really push for defending our democracy, standing up for our values um, in foreign policy, and generally being more proactive and energetic um, around our national security. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much indeed, Catherine. And, and I really appreciate uh, your, your very honest remarks in the sense of, you know, taking the, the purest approach, as you said, so, you know, talking about, you didn't use these words, but the realities of power, that maybe the, the Conservative Party is under, but at the same time saying quite correctly, of course, that we seem to have lost a passion or dropped the ball, and that's where it needs to be picked up. So thank you very much to both of you. I turn to Ed Lucas now. I'm dying to ask you some questions using both your hats so because of your background experience, but I think I think I better not preempt anything and and let you let you see what you want to say first, and we'll come and I'll come back with questions both from myself Good. and the audience. Well, I think we are running out of time, so I'll be very brief. And I just want to say, if you don't get a chance to ask a question, my Twitter DMs are open. You can find me on LinkedIn and various other ways. So I'm very happy to continue um, offline. And I just want to say that there are Conservatives who are really worried about this. I know one Conservative mm -hmm. who was so horrified by uh, what was going on that they um, gave back a large sum of money which had been given to the constituency party by a, um, a, a person whose name I don't mention here for fear of attracting the sort of scrutiny that my friend Catherine Belton has um, achieved. Um, and I do think the trajectory is really good. I was just looking back at the first piece I wrote on this, which is called Glitzkrieg in 2011, which was a guide to how to launder reputation. And this was considered rather eccentric to writing about it. Now reputation laundering is the stuff of conferences. I also wrote a piece also for The Economist in 2012 called They Sell Seashells um, about how London is actually a much worse place than the so-called sunny places for shady people and looking at the trust and company service providers. And this produced an absolute blizzard I was told it was the most naive and utopian piece The Economist had ever published. That was not by my editor, by the way. That was by a PR man for one of the um, for one, one of the trust and company services providers. Um, but it was it was all quite eccentric then, and it is very gratifying that it's mainstream now. So that's good. Um, but it's still really shocking 
Um, I've just been, uh, my, one of my favourite occupations, because I'm kind of sad, I um, should be a train spotter really, but I go to a company's house and try and find out good examples of silly companies. And there are just two I want to bring to your attention. One is this magnificent one, which is run by Mr. XXXXXX. It's, he's the remaining director of Enterprise Mechanical Services Limited. Um, which is a Northern Irish company which got into trouble over asbestos. And I'm sure that's great comfort. But even better than that is this one. You want to see Jesus Christ, director of a company called Wait a Minute Limited. Um, he gives his nationality as heaven. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, his nationality is angelic. His country of residence is heaven. And his occupation is crater, which is completely wrong. That's his dad. So even, even that is, is, is a mistake. Um, but it's, it's, and, and the most depressing thing is when you go to company's house, there's a thing at the top which says ver the information is not verified. Um, and you go and click on that and it just says we just carry out basic checks. I said, I was like, slightly wonder what the basic check was, where they're able to say that Jesus Christ and XXX were um, people. But it is, it is just, it is a scandal. And this limp excuse from the government that we're waiting for parliamentary time to be available um, when they have obviously so much other, other time on their hands is, is, is astonishing. And I was the first witness to the ISC Russia inquiry. And I think that's really where the, um, is, is, is the point I want to focus on. The ISC and parliamentary committees generally are really important because they pull together all the different bits of society where the dirty money gets in. So we should have the education committee looking at universities, for example, and saying, what are you doing about Chinese and Ukrainian and Russian Money. We need to have the Home Affairs Committee looking at stuff in the criminal, ju in, in the criminal justice system. There's a, this, this penetrates all over the place. And what I found so frustrating was that I, I told the ISC as the first witness, you've got to range widely. It's not enough to go and ask the services um, what they're doing. You need to haul in other people as well and then try and put together what the services are telling you and what's happening in the non-secret world. And to see that report delayed um, by the government and then attempt the government's attempt to have it squashed was actually a thing that made me think I have to give up all this and go into, go into politics. Um, the trajectory, what, what, what is depressing, I think, is that there is, we are so far behind the curve in dealing with what one might call the legitimate but bad money. And all these things we're talking about are fine if you say, I am the head of the Moscow traffic police and I want to buy a mansion in Mayfair, because obviously on your salary of two or 3,000 euros a month, you can't do that. But if you say, I, I own a Russian aluminium company, then it's quite hard to say why you shouldn't. Yeah, that, that will pass most of the test. If you go back and ask about the aluminium wars of the mid-1990s, you may find something quite fruity, um, possibly enough to stop someone getting an American visa, but apparently not enough to get them into trouble here. So that legitimate but bad stuff bothers me. And also the, the criminal services industry, and quite how powerful it is. And another thing that's really depressing in the United States is the way in which the really big players have managed to dodge the bullets that are flying around. So the use of the art market is an absolute scandal here. You can buy um, antiquities for cash. It's a wonderful way of laundering dirty money, and particularly if you then put them in these sort of weirdo places at airports, which is in customs-free zones and no one ever sees them. And the American antiquities dealers got hit by this. And so if you want to buy valuable Greek and Roman coins with your ill-gotten gains, well, then there's going to be all sorts of checks. But the art market, the high-end art market, non-antiquities dodged it. And so did the American Bar Association. And the abuse of attorney-client privilege um, to launder money is an absolute shock. It's a, it's a hole in the American system as big as companies' house is in ours. I think we have got a model for this, which is terrorism finance. And if you say to the American government, there are someone in ex-Yugoslavia is, you know, there's some Hezbollah connection, and there's Hawala going on, there's money and maybe a bit of drugs and some guns, you get their attention. Absolutely. They've understood since 9-11 that, that finance is the lifeblood of terrorism, even perhaps more than ideology is. And we haven't yet done that when it comes to corruption. We need to apply the same sort of whole of government, whole of society, um, lens informed by all the tools and tricks of the intelligence service to push back on it, and we're not there yet. Um, so I think we need a much broader approach than we've got, and we need to light the political fire underneath this. This is not an arcane train spotter sort of approach. This is something that makes us less, less safe, less free, and less prosperous. And that means talking to the voters, which is what I do three times a week, even when the weather's really horrible. <laughs>
Ed, thank you very much. I must say, I'm absolutely fascinated by, uh, by the fact that it was the withholding of a tri attempted suppression of a Russia report that drove you into politics. I never knew that. Listen, I'm, let me just come back on you before I maybe open out to, to the larger questions. It's a question from a previous session. It was asked by Henry Excite, but I want to ask it to you because it fascinates me and, and you as a political analyst. But Liz Truss was sitting approximately three inches to your left about six hours ago. And she said the most fantastic things on Ukraine. You would have agreed with every word. I don't know if you heard it, saw it, but, you, but you, there was nothing wrong with that. So how do you explain this dualism, as Henrik said, between that, there's the strong support for Ukraine, the, the tough stuff on Russia, and the open door approach? How do you, how do you explain it? Go. Well, I think there's several reasons. One is plain ignorance. Yeah, this stuff's quite complicated. This room's not full. Most people are not um, following it. And I run regular cross-party dinners for MPs where I get people like Bill Browder along to try and talk to them. And they are alarmed and shocked. It's not that they're just they're naive and complacent. They just didn't know this stuff. And once they're told about it, um, you do see the wheels turning. And that was how we got Magnitsky sanctions through. It was through this sort of process of just banging away at MPs and Tory MPs going away from the dinner and saying, we have to talk to our whips. It's ridiculous that we're opposing this. We should be supporting it. That's one point. There's a more sinister explanation, which is that there is... Um, extreme sensitivity at the height of government, put it euphemistically, about the activities of people whose fortunes originate in Russia and the former Soviet Union. And that's a sort of, you know, more conspiratorial, but I'm afraid there's something in that. And then there's a, th a third thing, which in a way to me is more worrying, which is the way in which that whole sort of world of off off offshore finance and um, stuff that's sort of half in the city and half in um, Belize or Bahamas or Barbados or wherever, and I don't specifically not make any allegations against any current or former um, treasurers of the Conservative Party here. I just chose those examples completely at random. But you know, in that world, this stuff is, at, that's the sea they swim in. It's like trade unions used to be for the Labour Party. And they are allergic to any kind of crackdown on it. And as Oliver has pointed out, and I was very glad to see his question, this is just the corrupt end of a much bigger problem, which is this sort of money land world of unaccountable, untaxable, untraceable um, fortunes. And I'm afraid that that is deeply rooted in the rich end of how this country is run. And that's the political subsidiary of that is the Conservative Party. Very interesting. And you, one thing you didn't mention there was you don't think it's about reprisals. You don't think it, the government is worried that they had, if they were to take this action, there would be some form of reprisal. That wasn't, wasn't a reason you gave. I think one has to be careful about this. I mean, it's very easy to say, you know, the KGB let down the tiles on my bike. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it does bother me that there's a hypothesis, and I'll put it no more strongly than that, that what got Litvinenko killed was his um, involvement in the um, Anglo-Spanish operation that was looking at the overlap between Russian organized crime and Russian intelligence in Spain. And I think this, this report mentions that and also highlights this may have been something that got Sergei Skripal into trouble, that he was helping some other countries look at the overlap between his former GRU colleagues and organized crime. And these are troubling, and these people do, and they, but I, I don't think we're at that stage yet. Okay. No. Right, let's move on. We've only got, uh, we've got to finish on time. We've got only just over 20 minutes, I I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen. Let me start with a question for Catherine, if I may. Catherine, you can still hear me, yeah? Yes, yes, excellent. So yeah. how can how can Labour, uh, James Bolton Jones asks, how can Labour, perhaps through its illicit finance task force and through cooperation with opposition parties, persuade the Conservative Party to be more proactive in dealing with the issues being discussed here? I'll take questions one at a time this time, in contrast to the last one. Thank you, Chair. I think um, at the moment, the All Party Group, which is obviously chaired by Margaret Hodge on, um, you know, anti-corruption, that is playing a really important function and I think whenever I hear Margaret speak and just um, last week we had the finance bill she gave an excellent speech within that on the very simple things which we're talking about tonight which need to be done um, and so I think it is partly spreading that out a bit more to other colleagues um, and I think that I do I do strongly feel like having let a council myself and know what it's like when you're actually in government you do get very sort of taken over by other events um and i feel that the reason we have the sort of i guess the luxury in opposition to have this Ill illicit task force and to be at meetings like this that you actually have that little bit more bandwidth to think and to organize your thoughts to take advice and so on um and so you know i think that's 
really were very well positioned to do that. And as the way that we're setting it up, we're keeping very um, much the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, you know, within these conversations. Tom Tuggett has invited me to come and speak to the Select Committee um, next week, um, because we know that there are a lot of people who are just as concerned as us. Um, and I think the important thing is just to sort of keep banging on about it, really. Um, and also to think, you know, we must do better, that whichever the government is that comes in next must do better. Um, so that it's both a sort of a getting the government to push on what it's already planning to do around the reforms, which Edward and I have already mentioned, but it's also trying to gather best practice. Um, and I know that um, my now boss, David Lammy, who is um, very, very well connected with the Democrats, um, will be getting lots of lessons when he goes to um, Washington around these instruments and how they can be used more effectively um, and just really tightening things up. Um, and I think that, you know, it is very important that we have the cross-party support. I do feel, you know, a lot of these things have to come from the government because they need parliamentary time. Um, you know, they need, you know, the, the various things that you do in government to line things up and to get them through. Um, so, you know, I feel that, that the government has been very slow because it was committed to doing all this back in 2015 under David Cameron, and there really is a different feeling now in parliament. And I think we have got to push much harder those of us who can through a forum like this today um, and you know just really try and you know call for these improvements because it, you know it's all very well to have these good debates about Ukraine which is what we had you know yesterday and then we had a, a very good one on Bosnia Herzegovina last week and so on and you know you can see the sort of the Russia influence in all of those different theatres but there's so much we can just be doing at home um, and so I think it's just a matter of just continuing to bang on and also using civic, civil society like yourselves to push harder. Thank you. I'll, t I'll do one more follow up question to you, Catherine, and I'll take and I'll go to Alex and I'll do some questions from the floor. I won't ignore you. Uh, people in Chatham House. Uh, Catherine, uh, my colleague Duncan Allen asks, um, uh, he says, where does reform of UK lobbying legislation fit into this? Has the Labour Party got a take on that? We haven't really discussed lobbying so much. Well, that's a really good point because, of course, um, I've just had a coffee before I rushed over to get online now over in the Pugin room. And, um, you know, you do see a lot of the ministers and particularly um, I always feel with the House of Lords, it is less, um, it is held to account in a different way. But there are plenty of ministers and so on having coffees with all sorts of different people. Um, and we do need to tighten that up as well. I mean, personally, I... I believe in, an, in an, a completely elected second chamber. I'm pretty sure Edward does too. Um, and, you know, it's not that the people, there's anything wrong with the ones who are in there now, but I just feel they should be on a ticket and voted for. It's much more straightforward. Um, and, um, you know, there needs, we need to strengthen the threshold for getting into the House of Lords. Some of you may be aware that, you know, the son of the KGB was appointed to the House of Lords, mm -hmm. has virtually no record on Hansard. He probably gave a maiden speech at some point, but, you know, for some people, I think, you know, it's like a bauble. You can put it on your, it's a sort of a mark that you've made it in society, but that's not really what the second chamber should be about. They should be talking about crime and antisocial behaviour and how we sort out all the things that people actually want us to be talking about in Parliament. Mm -hmm. So um, we have a lot of heavy lifting to do in terms of our constitution as well. Um, and that's the sort of thing that I don't feel is helped by the opacity um, of our current arrangements. Yes. Thank you, Catherine. Of course, one can only speculate as to what that person's father may or may not have told him to put in his maiden speech. We just don't know. Um, uh, so, Alex, um, I haven't got a specific question for you, so I'll sort of have to make it up on my own a little bit. First of all, uh, Catherine said that David Lammy uh, is coming to the US to get some tips. So, I mean, I, I suppose I might ask you a sort of a sort of facetious question is what would you advise David Lammy if he was coming over? That's partly what he was. Uh, uh, when, when, I know you won't, probably won't see him, but that's it. But let me ask you a specific question for me as well. Um, I understood it, but uh, you can sort of make your name in politics um, by being a prosecutor. You can take on corruption cases. You can win them. It gets you kudos. It gets you badges. And, and this, is a, this is a way of because I'm, I'm taken by Jason's uh, point that there's disincentives. Uh, in the UK to taking on kleptocracy, but it does seem to me that there are incentives in the UK, political incentives, which could get you on in your career if you were to take on kleptocrats, if you were to take on corruption in some ways. Is that fair? Is that still happening or has that gone by the by now? Well, 
I do think you know, the traditional high profile cases have come under the FCPA. And you know, we do have a number of um, quite uh, uh, you know, famous or infamous um, settlements that have been negotiated um, that are out there on the record and they have brought attention to some of these uh, issues. Unfortunately, they've also brought attention to some of the real gaps and loopholes um, that we have in the FCPA. And there's gonna be attempt, for example, to rectify that um, you know, through a you know, pending provision that the FCPA will also apply to private actors overseas, um, as well as uh, you know, government actors. So uh, uh, you know, it's, it, it's not particularly uh, beneficial, I would say, at the highest level. I don't think the American public is that engaged with overseas anti-corruption matters. But I do have um, just a comment, uh, you know, picking up on, on Catherine's point, I think one thing, you know, I'm, I'm not going to defend the state of American politics right now, goodness me, but one thing that really strikes me is over the last few years, even during the Trump era, um, the state of counter-corruption legislation has been perhaps the only major bipartisan area of agreement. And that's a real tribute to commitment on, um, by certain legislatures. It's commitment to Paul Massaro, uh, who leads that committee. Um, and the Helsinki Commission. And so, you know, in some ways, it's, 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 I think, a model of making sure everyone is engaged in each one of these pieces, right? Having uh, people from across the political spectrum and different parties uh, uh, involved as we put together this patchwork of new measures. Um, so I think that's one thing, you know, one possible lesson uh, I would advise. Thanks very much, Alex. Okay, I said I wouldn't ignore the Chatham House people here, so I'll take three questions from the centre. So we'll start with gentlemen yeah, front and centre right here. Yep, yeah, black mask. Thank you very much indeed. So if you stand up and maybe take your mask off, thank you. Or maybe you don't stand up. Just, thank yeah, you. Just... Uh, my name is Gubad Ibadoglu. I am senior uh, visiting fellow at the London School of Economics. I'm originally from Azerbaijan. And I have two questions, one of them rhetorical, another one uh, must be answered. Uh, how big the London tradable property market, I want to ask, and uh, how many years it will take for the, uh, for the oligarchs from the post-Soviet areas, for the politicians to buy whole and the entire London tradable property market. I want to calculate, and this is my uh, rhetorical uh, the question. And the second question, I am citizen of Azerbaijan. Every day I am passing uh, the Victoria Palace on my way, walk from home. Most of the building around the Victoria Palace belong to the Aliyev and the Aliyev families and the, his associated shell companies registered uh, in the UK. This building where we- yeah, Can I ask you, to, you've got, you know, we've, we're really out of time. You've got to come to a yeah, very this, quick end. Yeah, just I'm going to ask this building uh, bought the money stolen from the Azerbaijan people. And they stole my share also. Who and where can we comply here in the UK? Okay, understood. I can't comply inside because there is no independent court in Azerbaijan. Okay. Does it make sense with the current UK legislation? I want to ask the I'll, Catherine. Yeah, I'll take it as a rhetorical question, but thank you very much indeed. Uh, Ewan, and then Anna, please. Yeah, um, thank you very much, um, Ewan Grant. Um, former intelligence analyst covering ex-Soviet states. I'm a constituent of Catherine Barnard. Um, my question for all of you is, um, what about cooperation between the US in view of the new US legislation and its enforcement and the UK with Switzerland, EU member states and EU central bodies because there is still a gaping hole in the European countries. Remember that Danska and Banque de Economy, the money came via 
other countries in the EU. It did not come directly to the UK, and indeed it went out. And just a uh, qu quick question for Mr. Colley. Um, in view of a very significant, hugely significant point you made earlier on, Mr. Colley, have you read the supposedly fictional book Commander in Chief, which was the last book written um, from the notes Tom Clancy left behind. I can assure you it is not treated as fiction in Vilnius. Okay, thank you very much indeed. It's a reading list for you there, Alex. Uh, and finally, Anna Matveva, please. Thank you, yes. Uh, my question is for Catherine West. Um, as a constituency MP, how the questions of uh, kleptocracy, luxury pro property ownership, which uh, some of them, the yeah, alleged uh, kleptocrats, have actually in your constituency yeah, in Highgate, do they come in your work in some way? And if yes, what steps are you taking or planning to take? Thanks, Anna. Uh, let, let's go to let's go to Catherine first in that case, particularly on that last question of uh, property ownership in Highgate and who comes to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, some friends might know that there's a, a, a 500 room mansion in Pond Square um, or just off Pond Square as you go down towards the Heath, which is owned by a certain famous um, individual. Um, and there's plenty in Highgate, which is um, very attractive to foreign buyers. And I think bringing together the point by our last questioner about what's the sort of impact on the constituency MP level. You know, the obvious one is the complete unaffordability of homes for, you know, Edwards or my children, that kind of generation. Um, and that's really where um, we have to get real about the impact that it's having long term. You know, and obviously there's now a lot of Chinese people buying homes as well because, you know, London property is a good investment. Um, and this is the sort of sort of loophole area that we're really very keen for the government to tackle. Um, and so kleptocracy does have an impact on that. The other thing that my constituents care a lot about um, is a lot of them come from, um, you know, African countries or countries where, you know, they, they've basically come to the UK either as refugees or for work. Um, and, you know, the fact is that we know that kleptocrat uh, kleptocratic um, arrangements um, pit the global south against all other economies in, a, in the most enormous way. And we end up just having so many people having to basically be based in London and other places for work, um, when actually they could be working, you know, in their own countries as well, for example, African nurses and so on. So it's all very knock on in terms of the effect. Um, but there's a deep passion, as um, our first speaker said, regarding Azerbaijan, for people to have justice, social and economic justice in Azerbaijan, in Russia, in Belarus, in all those countries where assets have been stolen um, and where people have not been held to account. Um, and I think that's what I feel quite sort of passionate about with this illicit task force is that I want the our legal services in London, not just to be able to provide the most expensive divorce in the world and have the best lawyers who look after you know, um, if, if you feel your reputation's been wronged. But I want really to use our court system, if we can, to bring to heal, to bring to justice those terrible cases where goods have been stolen from people um, and they're left living in poverty and there's a tiny less than 1% living in Mayfair. Um, and somehow I think if we can get good people like Edward onto, into, into um political life and we can join up cross party and we can learn from the US, um, then I think that we could hopefully get some social justice and economic justice for people from Azerbaijan. We would, my constituents would be happier because they would think that I was doing something for Africa and for the economies there. And finally, just on the EU point, um, it's true to say that, you know, it's quite complicated, the EU picture. We're aware that there are problems with Malta, Cyprus and other places, um, and we mustn't shy away from looking at those as well. Um, and I feel that that is perhaps something which we might do a separate Chatham House about at one point, because there's a lot of detail in the actual EU arrangements and how all that works. But we must also, you know, have laser like focus on there as well, because that's a very influential part of the world, which um, we mustn't ignore. Um, but on the whole, it's just about common sense. It's about honesty, 
and it's about trying to um, basically make our societies across the piece more equal so that people have access to you know a roof over their heads and they have access to um, a decent quality of life and they don't feel as though things have been just stolen from them by um, overbearing governments. Thank you, Catherine. And for a tip on the next Chatham House follow-up event on in, in, in the EU dimension to this, which has been ignored, it has to be said. Uh, Ed, I know you wanted to say something on property uh, in Highgate or <laughs> somewhere else in London, perhaps, but I, can I also ask you, I ask you to multitask? There's a question here online from Graham Barrow. He asks, uh, why is it, do you think, that we seem entirely content to allow companies to be created in the UK which have no personnel, uh, no premises, um, and, but yet uh, uh, no e no, not even any economic activity in the UK? So why do we do that? Another, another why question for you. Uh, because we're lazy and stupid. <laughs> but, um, the, um, I, I mean, it's one of the excellent um, recommendations is that any company registered here has to have a named individual who is personal li personally liable for any faults and um, inconsistencies or inaccuracies in its, in its registration documents. Um, I think there's two big principles that we need to get back in on this. One is to get away from this whole idea that you're managing a risk. I was on a panel yesterday with an excellent um, person from one of our biggest banks who said in scrupulous detail how they minimise the risk. And I said, I'm fed up with hearing about risk. There are two other words that um, I want to hear which are wrong and right. And it's possible that something is very low risk, but it's still completely wrong. And he said, well, that's the definition of wrong, is it's risky. I said, well, not really. So if you're managing the risk downwards, you may not actually be, you're just finding which boxes you have to tick in order to be able to say it's all right. So I think we need to get back to a more old-fashioned idea of morality, which has been pushed out of the way, I think, partly because of the way in which limited liability um, shields people from the consequences of their actions when partners in ac accounting companies, accounting firms were personally liable um, for their giving their audits. They saw things very differently from when they're just a, just a shareholder and it's your you know, most maybe your bonus at risk. And that brings me on to my second point. I think we need to change the legal framework here. My suggestion is that shell companies, and by that I mean companies where we don't know who the ultimate, ultimate beneficial owner are, aren't able to make binding contracts. You can't use a shell company to buy something. If the shell company owns something, it can't rent it out. The shell company can't rent from another landlord and the shell company can't sell something. If you want to do it, you have to say who the real person is. And that would immediately revolutionize the way in which they've been able to um, be behave in this country. Now, there might be a human rights challenge on this on the grounds it affects the right to property, but to bring the human rights challenge, they would have to say who owned them, so then it wouldn't be a problem anymore. And I'd also say that shell shop companies shouldn't be able to enjoy limited liability. Um, then that immediately reduces, and the same with the Scottish limited partnerships, you shouldn't have a limited partnership if you don't know who the actual people are. And that would, as a stroke, change the way, the, the, the value of these things would not completely evaporate, but would, would collapse. Um, so I, um, Catherine, be very careful about saying nice things about me because it's against the Labour Party rules to say anything nice about an opponent. Okay, well, since we're so short a time, I'm going to ask the broadest of broad questions to all three of you, um, <clears throat> which is, you've seen the recommendations, both Catherine's and more particularly the nine recommendations of this report. And I just want to, if you could speculate a little bit on, on the implications of not taking on these recommendations, where does it lead to? What's the sort of, a, not so much the end game, but what, what, is, what is the, I don't want us to go home too depressed and slit our wrists, but you know, what's the worst case scenario here if we just sort of trundle on as before and we don't take notice of what this report is saying and, and the distinct problems that we're facing, particularly in the UK? Can I start with you, Alex, please? Yeah, I think the implications um, of not taking these recommendations is we start to get, uh, you know, more and more coverage of these gross violations of these loopholes and, uh, you know, serious damage credibility about what the rule of law is. And I think also a demonstration effect that others can follow the lead and use these service providers and these systems for their own purposes. One other aspect of this I would flag is just the importance of investigative journalism. And actually, this is in the Biden uh, counter kleptocracy strategy, right? The idea that overseas investigative journalists need to be protected, supported at the official level, and integrated into global networks to assist in these um, investigations that are increasingly complex and do have um, global, different uh, global aspects to them. Very much. Same question to you, please, Catherine, if I may. Thanks, Chair. Just on the investigative journalists, we know um, 
a, a court, court case at the moment with Catherine Belton, who is the author of the excellent book, Putin's People, just to give you a sense. Out, I may say so. Oh, wonderful. Oh, she's my favourite. She'll, you know, lots of um, books under the Christmas tree. Catherine's favourite. Um, but, you know, it's that sort of work, which is um, very strong, very well researched, but which, of course, she's been dragged through the courts over. Um, and it's, you know, really protecting her and other people like her, um, you know, Oliver Bollock and all the others who have, who have written in this same area so that they can feel free to write this um, and that, you know, it will be challenging because, you know, people um, who have a lot of money will not like um, necessarily these things being said, but just that fearlessness. It's really important um, that we maintain that freedom of expression because it's getting um, such, it's becoming such a rare commodity across the globe. Um, the second thing is really just post Brexit, we actually have an opportunity to redefine our economy a bit. Um, you know, obviously, for those of you who know me, I was very strong, um, strongly in favour of remaining in the EU, but obviously, there are some um, opportunities and coming out of Brexit, I would really like us to be, you know, a wonderfully vibrant economy, um, but where it doesn't all end up in just sheer inequality. Because at the moment, if we continue going the way that we are, you know, London will end up as a place that only the very, very wealthy or a few people who live in social housing can live. There won't be many people in the middle. And um, as we know, successful um, economies and societies are those where there's a genuine mix um, and where you can, you know, run businesses and things, but that you can also um, have neighbours who are doing well as well. Um, and my third point would be um, just that, you know, we, what we want to see as well is a vision um, in terms of the global peace where corruption isn't the byword for um, as many developing nations, um, that we take that on as well um, and that we, you know, have a vision for the eastern part of Europe where, you know, ordinary people have a chance um, and are not oppressed by the level of um, corruption and violence um, that sadly so often goes hand in hand with high levels of corruption. Thank you very much, Catherine. Ed, as we're over the hour, I'll leave it to you. You did say interesting in your remarks, in your earlier remarks, you, you thought the trajectory was really good, but you also said we're behind the curve when it comes to legitimate but bad money. So maybe take, take it from that. Yeah, I, I think the danger is almost that we are where we are now, where um, people become, and I, I, I see this all the time on the doorstep, people are have gone from being furious about the oligarch-owned um, flats all around them where you have no idea who the owner is and there's no one to complain to if anything goes wrong, and they go from being furious to being cynical to being apathetic, and then you just think politics is a farce and you either don't vote at all or you vote for the funny guy, which is you know, pretty much what, what, what happens. And the funny guy thinks, I can get away with it because I'm funny. And I can ignore, um, I can abuse the intelligence and security system, I can abuse the courts, I can, uh, and, and you slip away from the kind of democracy that we grew up in to something that's uh, um, perhaps familiar in other countries, but not to, not to us. And I'm, I'm glad that people still really care about it, but I worry that they, they're, they're going to start thinking it's like the weather and the world's run by the rich for the rich and what can you do? So have a laugh. Thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry to keep you behind after school, but um, that was very important indeed. Let me just say, really, all I really want to do is to, to thank you all, um, particularly, of course, the panel, Alexander Cooley, Catherine West and, and Ed Lucas, um, my Russian Eurasia programme team, uh, particularly Tom Main, of course, who's been integral to, to, to this, but wider than that. Um, my, my boss, actually, Robin Niblett, standing in the background, has been very supportive. Um, and, and of course, John, John Heathershaw's wider uh, Global Integrity ACE team as well for this Chatham House report, which, I, as I say, I'm so very proud of, and uh, hopefully we can push it out there for the impact it will have, needs to have, must have, hope it has. Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye.